when a video is successful, the creator takes all the credit. When a video is not successful, the algorithm gets all the blame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's funny. But is that really true? As YouTube creators, we have to consistently put out the best videos possible. But even when we do everything we can, there is still one thing that can stop us. The all-knowing, the all-seeing, When it comes to the YouTube algorithm, everyone has more questions than answers. And that's why we brought in this guy. At the end of the day, YouTube is audience psychology. Yeah. Mm. And we're all trying to understand that as best as we can. This is Rene Ritchie, and he is YouTube's newest creator liaison. And he gave us all of the cheat codes to finally understand YouTube's algorithm. The first act can't just be an introduction. The first act has to be a reward. The thumbnail makes a promise and the video has to deliver on it. As much as people talk about the beastification of YouTube, at the same time, we've seen this huge trend for emotionally invested videos. Generally, same audience, same channel. Which means that if you think someone who watched your last video would also enjoy that, it's worth testing on your same channel. What am I solving for? Am I solving for like a deep emotional story? Or am I solving for I'm bored, give me something? The Editing Podcast is brought to you by Riverside. It is the best remote video recording tool for podcasts. You can find out more about them later. Since this is the Editing Podcast, I've said let's just straight away start talking about editing. I think what has been interesting uh, in the past uh, 10, 15, how, long, how old is YouTube now? 15? Yeah, since 2005. 2005. And in the both past 15 years, I think social media has blown up. And I would say editing has had to adapt and to change due to the new rules that social media has been writing. And so we compare to what the rules of editing was 15 years ago compared to now, the change, uh, you can't even, I think it's difficult to even start to even to compare. So for you, how has YouTube changed editing today? I think the, the biggest part of YouTube is that, well, one, it started off with me at the zoo, which was basically what a YouTube short is now. Someone just recording a moment from their life with zero editing. Like there was just, I'm going to record this and you can't really do mobile editing. Now we have a lot of software for that, but I think it created almost like this organic, like person on the street, really easy style. But then people also realized that you could click off in an instant. And in the age of movies, you're in a movie theater and a movie has to be really bad for you to walk out of a movie theater. Even like the age of linear television, there wasn't much on and you like you could click away, but it was still like not much option. You became invested in shows. But now we have all of this online content. And I think you can't do the slow burn like you can't like introduce uh, Disney found this out. You can't like introduce the unlikable anti-hero character and give him half an hour to an hour to change because people will click away. And I think. You summed this up actually really well in one of your first videos where you said yeah, on Survivor, they can do a slow burn for an hour and kick somebody off. But for Mr. Beast, he's got to kick somebody off immediately to reward that click. And then he earns a little bit of consideration to go into the story. I guess we're out. We're out of here. I think for the first five, I would even say first five to 10 years, I don't really think we had that realization. Or maybe just a little bit we're developing it. But I think only recently in the past five years, we went, wait, people it is so easy for them to leave. So we do have to start doing everything that we can to giving them consistent reasons to stay because they can go at a blink of an eye. Yeah, the story structure almost inverts where you don't have like the first act can't just be an introduction. The first act has to be a reward because like the thumbnail makes a promise and the video has to deliver on it. And if it delivers at the end, there is no way you're going to see that. It has to deliver at least something in the beginning. And I think like the, one of your shows with Michelle Carey was so great because she, she showed you the fight in the beginning. Like she teased that's going to be the ending. And then the payoff was like the emotional resonance of that. Like you knew she was going to fight, but you didn't know the impact that was going to have on you after you'd seen the journey. There was a cold open. It was like it showed us the climax of it. And then she then actually had to set up the promise of, hey, please give me 40 to 50 minutes of your time for us to lead up to that climax. But she did kind of deliver on that promise kind of straight away. And I think that's one of the biggest changes, I would say, in comparative to what editing or storytelling was 10, 15 years ago, whereas, or even still today in TV and traditional media, where I think we, they would like to make, let's just say, the climax. The best part of their film and TV is right at the end because you want to have that lasting impression right at the end. But they're assuming that everyone and likely is still watching it. Whereas for us, we've had to flip that script, literally, and we have to make sure that sometimes the best part of our entire video 
is right at the start. And then we still assume that people are gonna be clicking off over time. So why are we putting the effort of the best part of our video at the end when we potentially lost more than 50%, maybe even 60% of our audiences? Yeah, and it's it's they've had a mechanic for that in television and movies. Like they've had the flashback, yeah. which some editors and writers think is like a cheat or a trick or like just like not not good storytelling. But they use that when they had when they knew the initial part of the story wouldn't be as good, or or they knew they had to hook people. But it's still like you would never have Avengers Endgame. The portal scene wouldn't be the flashback. It would be Captain America standing in front of Thanos's army. It would be the flashback, and then like ten days earlier or something like that. And now you really are. And it's scary because like, this is my best thing. I want to save it. I want to earn it. And you realize nobody may see it if I don't. And I still like, I'm even hearing the music yeah. of that and it's getting me emotional right now. But it was because they knew that in the movie, they, ha they can spend that time to earn that emotion. Whereas you're right on YouTube, we would essentially might have to open with that and essentially spoil the whole movie right at the start if Avengers Endgame was uploaded onto YouTube. But because it be started to become democratized, people weren't going to like, they weren't like ACE. They weren't going like through editing school and learning traditional techniques. And you started to have this explosion of like, what if I just did this? Mm -hmm. And because they didn't have like a boss editor who said, no, 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 we don't do that at the studio, sir or ma'am. Like mm -hmm. they, they got to try all these creative things. And I think the storytelling we're seeing on YouTube now because people are experimenting, sometimes they bring the best of traditional, but sometimes they make such eclectic and interesting choices. Because there is no gatekeeper. Yeah. Yeah, like you're the gatekeeper. You get to decide how this video works. So much so that I've, we are seeing content on YouTube now that is matching what we do also do see on television. Yeah, and I think the reverse is a little bit true where you're seeing some techniques that people have done on YouTube start to enter into mainstream media. Like early on, it was like run and gun. They started doing like some of the early Born Identity movies and they were just like, like Greengrass, I think, was a director, and he's just like unsteady cam and going in there and showing the intimacy of it. And I think now you you might start seeing a video where it looks less like less bokeh, so that you feel like you're in there, like a Mr. Beast video. I think all of those techniques are going to just migrate across the spectrum. It is. It's merging. But even I've been aware of. I think Netflix doesn't really give their showrunners or their editors the data that we as creators have access to, and so they would post. It's so funny. I say like they would post one of their films onto their service. Yes, <laughs> they would post their content on the service. Upload. <laughs> yep. But and then of course, and then they then receive that data, and then they then interpret it, and then they also then give that feedback. And I have been hearing the stories of showrunners and filmmakers of Netflix go into them and said, all right, like they see the script and go, no, we need an action sequence on the first scene. Otherwise, we will not make this movie yeah. because we know retention-wise, people will stop watching. Because I think yeah, Netflix is the same thing. It's like, oh, this isn't working for me. I'm going to stop watching straight away. Yeah, but they're competing with YouTube. And YouTube is like, I, 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 rem I think we're the only service that grew uh, this year in terms of streaming. Um, and those techniques, like people like us work on retaining audiences. And that might have been an afterthought before. Like, I want to make a good story. Absolutely. But they probably didn't think, like, is the story going to grip somebody on a streaming service who has 800 other buttons that he can press at any given time? And I think that sort of uh, thoughtfulness, or you called it consideration, I think so well has to permeate the industry. Part of me actually makes this a bit sad. You mentioned slow burns. Yes. I think sometimes if you want to have, if you want to invest in a character, you do have to invest time into them as you would like relationships. You have to invest time. You can't love someone straight away. Yes. It's time. If you want to, again, same thing, care about this person, you have to give specific moments. Yes. But I think, and so when we start going through this content and essentially we want them to care more though than just let's just entertain you or i would say a lot of filmmakers do that and i would say a lot of it is correct and probably open and a lot of it's open for interpretation is i think been teaching a lot of filmmakers that audiences don't care as much as we would like them to and i think that's probably been a really uh tough experience i think for a lot of filmmakers we're beginning to learn that actually a lot of audiences are not emotionally available i think there's two factors that are really interesting around that i think one is that um, there, there's different kinds of emotionally, like emotional reactiveness. Like one of the things we've seen, as much as people talk about the beastification of YouTube, at the same time, we've seen this huge trend for emotionally invested videos, but they're comfort content. Mm -hmm. It started off with study with me during the pandemic, but it's grown into like cozy camping and woodworking. And like, you don't want to learn the woodworking or like the leatherworking. You want to watch somebody who's a craftsperson do it. And because like you need that emotional connection with something and there's very little talking, they're hour long plus videos, they get millions and millions of views because people are just like, like you said, like, I just need to connect with another human being. And it's, it's not as active a storytelling connection, but it's more of a, like, I just want to be part of like this life for a little while. And at the same time, 
there's this like editors are sometimes not as respected in the industry as we'd like them to be. Like, and there's the, for every like auteur filmmaker who's like deeply involved with the editing, we all know examples of people who believe started to believe that they were too good to have a good editor. Like they knew everything, they'd make all their own decisions, and their work product was just terrible after that. And I think the understanding that oh, I don't own my audience. I have to earn my audience all the time. And a great editor is part of me respecting my audience and building a great story. I think this shows them like, I, I, I'm just not going to get all this stuff. Or if I do, like the reaction is not going to be good to it. It sort of revalidates the whole idea of editing. I think I had that experience myself this year. <laughs> I think I, uh, yeah, I was, I think I was editing uh, Mr. Beast's uh, blind video and where he was curing a thousand people's blindness. And I went into all tour mode. I went, this is, I'm going to make this the best bloody video for me. Yeah. And I made like this really great 12 minute version. And then Jimmy, who has a really good understanding of uh, audience and retention was like, this, this is, this is too pretentious, Hayden. <laughs> and, so, and so he he didn't have to pull me back. And then that then became one of his uh, like most talked about and best performing videos of this year because he was actually kind of had to put me, the pretentious auteur, on a leash a little bit. But I think that's what you want. You want yes. that interplay, that dynamic. And I think, yeah, I think a lot of filmmakers do make that mistake. You know? So this was recorded in our studio. And we also record podcasts remotely. And we're able to get that 4K crispy video with Riverside. If you're not using Riverside for all of your virtual meetings, you're making a big mistake. I've even been using it for consultations. As soon as we're done, I get to send them the entire recording. And not to mention the recording quality is freaking it's good, which is why we like to use it for podcasting. And we love it because it records each audio and video track separately so that editing is such a breeze when we get into post. Which means our editor can get started on cutting it almost immediately. And even if you or your guest has absolute garbage internet, it doesn't matter. Because remember that one time when we were in the hotel room? I mean, the call kept on jostling. I thought we lost it, but because Riverside records locally and then uploads, the call was perfect. And it's easy for the guests. I don't need to install anything. You just send them the link and you can start recording. It even says like, roll out the red carpet. It's kind of, it's kind of cool. Yeah, it makes it, me feel special. It makes me feel so special. Riverside can also auto transcribe your recording and use its text-based editing tool to edit it right there. If you're podcasting, creating video content, or recording online calls, then sign up to riverside.fm for free and use code editingpodcast for 20% off. And you can find that link in the description and we'll see you back in the interview. I'm curious because lots of people will blame the algorithm if something goes wrong. They'll say, oh shoot, like the algorithm is messing me up and it's like, it, it's not pushing out this amazing masterpiece that I made. But I think sometimes it's really like the audience that isn't interested in whatever you made. Is there a difference between the algorithm and the audience? How does the audience play into the decisions that content creators make? I'm just very fascinated by all that. Yeah, well, a mutual friend, Todd Beaupre, who runs Discovery and Growth at YouTube will say, like, when a video is successful, the creator takes all the credit. When the video is not successful, the algorithm gets all the blame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For real. Which is true because like creators like have an ego and it's hard for us to think that one of our like, you know, kill your darlings. But if somebody else kills our darling, it's like that was my darling. Um, but like I think one of the things that creators sometimes forget is that audiences have agency and they get to choose what they click on and watch. And we like and sometimes we feel like we make this product, you know, because I've been a creator since 2008. I posted my first YouTube video in 2008 that we make this video and then it's pushed out to 100 percent of people on YouTube. And I was like, why didn't they all watch it? But in reality, YouTube services the viewer. And so when somebody opens up, they picks up their phone or opens up their desktop, we pull the eight video tiles on the screen that we think they'll have the highest chance of clicking on, watching and enjoying so that they want to watch more videos afterwards. And that means that it's competitive. And also like you might be one of those, those eight videos, but also like it could be a Mr. Beast video or a Michelle Carey video. And maybe they have time to watch two videos and they watch Mr. Beast and they watch Michelle Carey. And it's not that you didn't have the impression. It's that your packaging overall didn't pull them in. And that's why like every video is competitive. And that's stressful for creators because we feel like these are our beautiful little darlings and we're putting them out in the world. But so are all these other creators at the same time. And audience time and attention is limited. And so everything is like, am I making a compelling package? And then am I delivering? Because if you're just trying to clickbait them, they're going to abandon that video quickly and the performance is going to tank as well. So you really have to make that whole like get their interest and then deliver it, just like we were talking about with, with the videos and the movies. And you're right. 
But I hate you all. <laughs> I, know, I feel it. <laughs> I hate that you're right because I think with my uh, experience uh, working for Logan Paul for the past couple of years, I think I didn't realize until now how much of a cheat code I was handed. Yeah. I Logan was able to do his charismatic thing, give me some really, really fun content. How are you doing? Boys, thanks for being part of the club. Of I've course, got much, yeah. so much love for you guys and uh, we're actually about to head to my ranch. I suggest you come. I edit it, just elevate it just a little bit more. Don't touch that thing, Kevin. What if I told mom and dad? Hey, don't you touch that dick! I touch my dick! I get out! We essentially just choose a random still from a video of his face, put it in a thumbnail and record it a day. We never cared about CTR, we never really cared that much about AVD, but the algorithm still way would just say, hey, this, this video is working and I want to send it out to as many people as possible. And so even for me, now that I've now moved on from him, I have now become a student again in terms of I have these really great skills and how I can edit a great video. But even for me, I've been having to relearn a lot of other things that I essentially skipped class on. I've been having to relearn how the album goes. And especially with that, when I first joined Logan almost eight years ago, the priority was subscriptions. Mm -hmm. You were a subscriber, you were notified when the video goes live and we assumed that everyone stopped what they were doing right there and then and watched the video. Yeah. And I still had that mindset a yeah. little bit. So even today, I'm trying to unlearn that. Well, just like really quickly, like you and I have very similar timelines because you were leaving Logan just as I was joining YouTube. Yeah. And I was making Apple videos. Like on my main channel, it's like all it was Apple videos. And I never had to think about what video to make. Mm -hmm. And because my videos, it's the same thing. It's The Simpsons. It's like the same thing, but different. And as long as you do that every week, people know exactly what they're going to get and they're going to just watch it. People start to choose based on the guest you have and based on the topic that you have. And from week to week, it's not like... Like, I'm absolutely going to, unless you like really love the host, like there, there are some people who bond with the host, but other people are like very guest by guest, topic by topic basis. And I have that problem on my channel now. I did a bunch of Twitter videos. People like, ah, you're the Apple guy. I'm not going to watch your Twitter videos. Did a bunch of AI videos. Ah, you're still the Apple guy. I'm not going to watch your AI videos. And that's really hard. So I'm relearning how to do that on my personal channel too. How has that been for you? Like what have you had to unlearn and now learn today? I think I have to figure out now like an, a strategy where I can provide people with an experience, like find out what videos are going to love for me going forward and then give them more of those videos to love. And that's the part that I didn't realize and I'm having to relearn now is what can I give people who loved my previous video that they're going to love next? The thing that I'm curious though, because when you said, you know, I'm going to do one for them and then one for me, and would you Good post- Sarah Dicci. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah she, I think she, she popularized yeah. that phrase and I love that. Yeah, but would you do that on the same channel or not? One of the things I'm stealing from Todd Beaupre is like, generally same audience, same channel, which means that if you think someone who watched your last video would also enjoy that, it's worth testing on your same channel. Formats can change sometimes. Like sometimes people like will think like the, this is like with shorts creators, like if you want to go from shorts to long or vice versa, they'll think it's just a longer or shorter version of the same. And it's not like the, it's not the shorter or longer version of the same content. It's the shorter, or longer version of the same feeling. Which I think is like someone like call me Chris is so good because her shorts and her long form, they're not structurally the same. They're not, it's like, it's not like a longer version of her short it's like i she understood the feeling you got from watching her short and she gave you that feeling in the long form video she just figured out like what the structure of that was and so i think like and if you could figure out that feeling but that then means uh the, the videos are still gauged on the initial audience so it is so if i was to make something that is a little bit of outfield compared to what my audience is expecting they're still the first gatekeepers onto whether the video is going to be shared to the audience I would like to have. So the way it works is it's just faster that way. So if, if you make a video that everybody who watched your previous video, like several videos, would absolutely love, they're going to engage with that really quickly. And the algorithm's going to be like, oh, I found an audience who loves this. I know exactly who this audience is. Let me just like show it to everybody who loves those things. And it'll be like a firework going off. Like people will watch it until everybody who, who has been shown it and wants to watch it has watched it. And then it'll die down. But the algorithm never gives up on a video. So it'll keep testing it. And over time, it'll try different audiences. And that's why sometimes you see spikes later on. Sometimes it's because another big creator put out a video on the same topic and you end up on the side like and suggest it. Sometimes because there's a big news story that happens. Like we know like uh, creator Jabrilis, he made a video that was very off topic on the Escher staircase. It did nothing for mm -hmm. two years. And then like one day, two million views, next day, six million views. Yeah. Like, because oh like it gosh. found, it's like, 
Oh. It had no idea who the audience was, but then it found it. It's like, yay, I know who it is. And it just starts serving it. And it's like fireworks. Like they might be small. Like we find a small little pocket of audience and that exhaust. And then sometimes there's really big pockets of audience. And so those videos, it just might take longer because we need somebody to search for it and enjoy it or to come across it and browse or to be shared that video. And then they watch it. And we're like, oh, we'll try it with more of those people. And if they don't watch, it doesn't go anywhere. But if they do watch, it's like, oh, we're starting to understand who likes this video. And then that just grows until we fill up that sort of audience pocket. We've talked about it already where I think we grew up where subscribers was a priority. Yeah. And we always was on the assumption that as soon as a video was posted, everyone stopped what they were doing and they watched that video. And we were trying to get that first wave. Uh, again, that's changed. Now we post that video and we're kind of like signaling, I'm going to send this out into the ether and this is going to exist forever. And anyone can watch it whenever they want. Yes. Why did this change happen? I think it's just like the volume of YouTube became so big and the nature of like why people subscribe started to evolve. Like in the old days, I think it was very much like an RSS model. Like it was literally a subscribe and then this is my feed. And there was no other way to discover videos. Like there was a homepage that was curated or your feed and you would like just find out about people, add them to your feed and then pick your videos to watch. But as it got bigger and bigger, that became untenable. And so we started with the recommendation system. But once you have that system, the chances of like the perfect video for you for that device, for your mood and for that time, which is what the algorithm tries to do. It tries to guess like in that moment, in those conditions, in that context, what's the best video for you. The chances of that being in this relatively small amount of channels you subscribe to is very low, but the entire corpus of YouTube is very high. So we see that with, um, for example, someone goes to the homepage, you, it might be a video you subscribe to, it might be not, but it's the one that you want to watch. And then people started to go, well, I really like this video. I'm going to give them a subscribe as like a super thanks or like a super like like or like a high five. Or some people, it's like I was nine years old when I subscribed. I'm 14 years old now. My tastes are completely different. Or I was doing a woodworking project. I subscribed to all these woodworking channels. Now it's like I don't care about woodworking anymore, but I'm, I'm too lazy to go and clean out my subscriptions. And we see now like on my channel, I get 30 to 50 percent of my views from subscribers, but only 4 percent click from the subscription feed. I have 14% of people with like the bell set to always. Six of them have turned off the uh, notifications for the app, I guess, because like there's too many notifications, <laughs> like, uh, which means they don't get any notifications anymore. And only 1% click through because they're out, they're busy doing something, they're watching something, it comes in, they're like, oh, I'll watch this later. And then they watch from the home, sc the home screen. People who are subscribed watch from the home screen. You see that like Michelle Carre's video comes like, I'm going to watch this on a television. Yeah. You know, I want to have that experience. So I think like it's moved on from subscribers to really be like a more recommendation type system. The end game is as soon as you're on my website, I need to give you everything to make sure you don't leave. If subscriptions stopped working, we switch recommendations because I want to give you better options right then to make sure that you stay for longer. Well, and the idea also, like around 2015, YouTube, like originally YouTube was based on click-through rate, like the yeah. recommendations, but then people just started clickbaiting. So it switched to, lot, to watch time, but then people just started like making these very long videos. So around 2015, they, uh, they stumbled on this idea of satisfaction. Like pe people will be, like they will rubberneck, they will watch like accidents, but they don't feel good afterwards. And so we wanted to figure out like, what experience could we give? Like, what could we look at in terms of data? And so now we run surveys, we look at likes, we look at like people's they're not interested. And we try to figure out like, will this video satisfy you? And then uh, Todd explained this, Todd Bopre explained this really well the other day, where he's like, initially we took a hit because people were like a short term hit because uh, people were still trying to figure out what it was. But over the long term, it started increasing how much people watched because they were having a more enjoyable experience. And so we figured out all watch time isn't created equal. And we would rather not have people like sitting there feeling horrible at themselves all day. We'd rather they like they're uplifted and they want to watch more content or more of that creator. TV and film do similar things. Uh, I, I think I've had, I've talked to many TV editors that swear on the cliffhanger. Yeah. Uh, and I think in, and nearly, and I think, and like Netflix and, and Max know this where it's like, they're aware of the binge model as well. And so they go through the episode and then near as the end, like everything's starting to settle, but then all oh, something else happens and off we go. And we go, I want to immediately know what happens next. And so we do continue watching, or let's just say in a Max or in Disney Plus's uh, case, they release that episode, we all get excited, cliffhanger, and then we all talk about it for a week. Uh, and I kind of do like that model and it's tried and true, but it seems to be oddly, creators are rejecting that concept. I think on YouTube, whereas I do really love that idea. I think I briefly spoke to Jimmy about it as well, but I love the idea of him making one of his game shows. Uh, 
I think he should probably start spreading that out a little bit. What if he does play a game show, but those episodes are released over the course of five days? So let's just say there is a couple people get eliminated, a couple people start like like getting closer to the win, and then there's going to be one person that uh, it's been designed that you kind of want to be rooting for that person. And let's just say it's like a big jump, and he's about to do jump, music builds up, cut. Yeah. Yeah. Come check out the video tomorrow. I've just said that, and that's kind of annoyed me, but it's also kind of like, ah, f you. Fine, I'll yeah. watch it tomorrow. I kind of like the, I do think it would be an interesting experiment for creators to kind of do cliffhangers and to encourage us to want to engage into the next video, the next day or the next week. You might discover that video a month after it came out and the cliffhanger might already be live and then you just want to naturally continue watching that. But we see sort of things like that with like Critical Role, yeah. where like they play Dungeons and Dragons for hours every week and millions of people tune in to watch them play episodic, sometimes cliffhanger, Dungeons and Dragons every week. And that model has also proven really successful. And again, because it goes back to that Simpsons, it's the same but different. They know next week I'm going to get more of what I just watched. And that in the industry... Previously, it was like they'd had seasons. So they would have like, traditionally in America, I think it was like 22, 24 episode seasons. And then there'd be like nine months where you wouldn't see it again. Or like House of the Dragons comes out whenever it's ready. Um, and you've got to reignite that fan base. And we hear that from YouTubers too, when they or creators too, when they take a, a break and they wonder like, is my audience going to move on to something else? And you realize like, I come back with like a big banger of a video and maybe setting that up before you leave is an option too. So I think like there's all these parallels towards media where, yes, all this is brand new for digital creators, but there are parallels we can draw from, from mainstream media. And I think that's a really good one to play with. Since I've been reflecting, when, once once you're in the thick of it, you don't notice it happening. And now I've been looking at all the outside perspective and you mentioning Logan. Yeah. Logan rebooted like six times. It's like who the content he made and he even experimented through things at the wall and saw what stuck. And that's like a good point about longevity too, because like sometimes people worry about like how long you can be a YouTube creator for, because like, again, in the creative industry, there are one hit wonders in music. There are actors who make like one or two big movies maybe one or two albums and it goes down and you have people like, I look at iJustine and she has been making videos since I think 2005 or 2007, something like that. And she grew, but like her shorts now are like cutting edge shorts. Like she's doing shorts like someone who's just invented the format and her ability to like reinvent herself over time and time again, that's not common in the industry, but it shows that it's possible. You have to think about it the same way like an actor reinvents themselves or Madonna reinvented herself through music. Yeah. So, so the best way to genuinely last for a consistently long time on YouTube is to prioritize your character, your personality. People want to tune in for that. And then that means that you can experiment, you can change things. And then you're no longer tied to the audience. The audience is now actually tied to you. Well, I think there's two things. Like one is like the algorithm tries to follow the audience, but, the, but creators have to follow the audience as well because like you might be doing this, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. People know that's not good, but sometimes doing the same thing over and over again, expecting the same results isn't good either because like things become stale, topics and formats become stale. So I think like the really good creators, like you said, like it's a similar thing, but you're repackaging it. You're giving it a fresh format, a fresh twist, a fresh angle, and you're keeping up not just with the trends, but you're like setting the trends. You made me realize something very very interesting. So you post the videos that you know are going to be bangers, like you, you're one to three out of tens and you post those a lot. And then that's the baseline expectation that you are now uh, expecting every time you post a video. And then you do an experiment and it's a 10 out of 10. Yeah. I think the mistake that I think a lot of creators are making is expecting it to be an overnight success. Yes. Rather than this essentially having to be something that you do consistently and you're right until over time audiences go, Hey, I haven't actually checked in on this creator for a while. Let me see what he's doing. Actually, this is new. I haven't watched this one. That was kind of fun. Yeah. I'm going to check out the next one. And then I think kind of just reconnecting the audience in that sense, like just developing a new relationship, a new style, a new feeling with them. And then over time, they will be convinced. But I think a lot of creators make the mistake of they try and experiment, it dies, and they never try yes. it again. Yeah. I mean, it's in everybody's best interest that creators succeed and videos succeed. And we never know when the next video somebody makes is going to be like bigger than Baby Shark. I think everybody wants, or the next Mr. Beast or the next Michelle Carey. So it's in everybody's best interest that we give every video every opportunity. The only difference is like, can you convert on that opportunity? Like, we're going to serve those thumbnails. Are people going to click on them? Are they going to enjoy it and like watch the video, maybe share? It or we'll find more audience because it doesn't matter how many impressions you get if people don't click or how many clicks you get if people don't enjoy the video. So it really is that we're going to, we don't give up on those videos, but when you get those chances, you, those videos have to be great. Essentially what I've been learning a lot of this conversation is to an degree, I have to blame myself. Like clearly I didn't package a video well enough. 
Clearly, I didn't invite audiences to why should I, they should choose my video right compared to that one, despite the fact I think I've made a better video. But I think essentially, I mean, the reason the question is like, why did that video get two million views? What compared to mine? Yeah, compared to mine, it's like that sounds like dickish, but you know what I mean. Yeah, no, no, totally. And I, I feel the same way because like I like there was a bunch of Twitter videos or like AI videos that got millions and millions of hits, and why didn't mine? And I've been like exactly where you are. And I think there's like a few things. One is that when Last of Us season two comes out, people might start looking for Last of Us stuff again, stumble upon that, and that might reignite that video. And that's one of those things about never giving up. Like there's always these opportunities to re-engage, or maybe there'll be like a huge story about the editor, like an editor quits or something on The Last of Us, be like, which editor was The Last of Us? And it'll come up. Um, but also like, what does an audience want from that video and how broad is that appeal? And it might be that people who are interested in the editing of The Last of Us is a much smaller audience than people who just want a hot take on it. And maybe if you repackage that video as a hot take that happened to include information information pulled from the editors and maybe that's not even in the title or thumbnail like people don't know it's just they're watching it and suddenly like like um Cleo Abrams does this really well. Like you're watching a Cleo Abrams movie, but then suddenly there's all these experts that are coming in and chiming on the subject and people want to vibe with Cleo and they love what she's saying and the experts sort of credential and like give authority to what she's saying. And so maybe like if you wanted this hugely performing Last of Us video, it would be like starts off with Hayden and Jordan's hot take on The Last of Us and people are like, that's so broadly appealing. And then the editors come in, like you cut to the editors to reinforce the points that you're making. And maybe that packaging has broader appeal than just an interview with the editors. When do you decide to package for broader appeal because when you package for broader appeal it seems like you're competing with all the broadly broadly appealing videos so is there a point where it's like oh, okay you're getting to a point where you should probably package broader or should you start off doing that right away well i think like we announced this week a b testing for thumbnails which i think is going to really help with that because like i've been testing it out and i will do like this is for my core audience package where it shows my face and it shows what i'm doing this is for the broad audience where it shows like the, in my case the device and maybe like more people care about the device than care about me and then i have like a third option which is sort of a balance between the two and i run them and i see what what's happening and it might be worth running those experiments several times because to your previous point the video is going to hit my core audience first so maybe it's like i package it for like the editing nerds like when it first comes out because i want my audience to click on it and engage it and then like i've known that th that dries up after like three days or a week or whatever time period and so i go in and i change the thumbnail i change the title and now i'm targeting like the last of us more broadly and i'm like this is like what you what you never knew about the last of us or why they never did this in the last of us and it's like why they never showed the bullet in the last of us or something and then people are like why didn't they and then they come in and they learn that and it's they don't care at all that it's the editors they just want that piece of information and then you've targeted your core audience and then the casual audience after that but then but then with the test to compare feature is that then are we able to signal hey send this to core audience and then send this out to a more general audience or is it a bit of both? Well, so it doesn't like, so basically your core audience is going to engage first. So yeah. like you can target it for your core audience first and then within 72 hours to a week, it's going to vary by channel. Like you'll, you'll tend to see when new users are, are coming in and when returning users are coming in. So like you could run that test maybe the first week and see and then run the, a test again the second week when it is more. I think uh, Gwen Miller, mutual friend Gwen Miller, who does all the analytics for the Hearst channels like Cosmo and, uh, and uh, GQ, she, she says like, one day is not enough, like 24, 48 hours is not enough. 30 days is great, tons of data, but you can't act on it anymore, it's too late. So she looks like the week view. And then when you look at that week view, you can try like your core audience for the first week and then break out into the mainstream audience after that. And then maybe just adjust depending on how your channel performs. Well, with the clickbait thing, I think I've always found it very funny when, I think during that dark time on the clickbait phase, a lot of creators made the video, went, okay, how am I gonna package this? And then they come up with the most outlandish clickbait thing ever. And we click on the video and we realize we're not gonna get we're not gonna be delivered on that and then we click off. And then Jimmy, Mr. Beast went, Well, what happens if I actually do deliver on the clickbait? <laughs> and so he went, actually these high concept ideas are good. You just thought about it afterwards. I'm gonna think about it first, deliver on that promise. Or over delivered. Or over delivered. Yeah. Like here is something outlandish, outlandish, ridiculous concept, and I'm gonna over deliver on it. And then so I will deliver on that clickbait. Yeah. And so I think he kind of reframed. So that that time was dark, but then Jimmy actually used that as inspiration and went, actually, I'm going to deliver on what everyone has been failing to failing to deliver on. And it just, that has what has created this massive spectacle era on, of, of, on YouTube, which I think a lot of, a lot, a lot of people have been enjoying, but I love that, that dark time 
the response was what we are having now. Yes, yeah. Uh, and like magazines are famous for putting like a celebrity on the cover, like bright, big face, colored background, and then a topic about sex, right? Like flashed yeah. right across. Because like, I mean, that's, that's like, that's, they were competing for attention on a newsstand the way that we're competing for attention on like a grid of thumbnails. These things are, like everyone's trying to understand audience psychology. At the end of the day, YouTube is audience psychology. Yeah. And we're all trying to understand that as best as we can. One of the things I have been enjoying though is that actually has for me developed a habit of, okay, I start watching this video, okay, I can watch this on my phone because it doesn't matter. Yeah. But then I might see a really, really gorgeous thumbnail or a creator that I know has been consistently delivering with really highly engaging content. And I then go, I'm actually gonna watch this on the television. And so I would choose to put it, I'll put it in my watch later playlist or I put it in my mental memory. I'm gonna watch this after dinner tonight. And, but, and I've started developing my habit more to be watching the content that I'm actually really excited about later on the television. I have been really enjoying this new rising of what I'm now calling premium content, which is funny because the, there is still, there is YouTube premium, yes. but this is, but this, yeah. like Michelle Carey, I would like, like Dodford, like Johnny Harris, even Yes Fury, I would consider them to be the premium content that I do watch on television. And I've been enjoying that rise as well. Yeah, I love that. Like, I think it's like, again, you go back to the parallels, I keep returning to this, like, I think, you can check me on the timeline, but like the West Wing and America's Funniest Home Videos or like The Wire and like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Like, and I think people have those two contexts where I want an experience where I'm leaned in and I'm engaged in a very thoughtful way. And other people are like, I just need candy. Like I've had this long day or like, you know, I'm, I'm just like really, I just want something to watch. And we used to think about this in the web world too. It's like, what am I solving for? Am I solving for like a deep emotional story or am I solving for I'm bored, give me something.